Uh, welcome to the UK Data Service Workshop on Copyright Issues in Secondary Data Use. My name is Hena and I work as a Senior Research Data Officer uh, within the Research Data Management team and I'm based at University of Essex. Um, in this session, I will focus um, on intellectual property rights, specifically copyright in the context of research. I will begin by explaining briefly what secondary data is, which is then followed by discussing what rights might there be in research. And I will also discuss some issues that are very important in this um, context, such as licensing, establishing right ownership, challenges in sharing social media data and national variation in copyright. Um, I will also discuss some best practice tips to ensure rights compliance when it comes to share your data for future reuse, and uh, finally, I'll point you to the resources that may be useful in this context, and uh, I'll answer your questions at the end. And um, if there are any specific project-related questions, you can always email me. I, I have added my email address on the last slide. So IP rights are the rights that are granted to creators of works that are the result of human intellectual creativity something that is created using your mind. For example, a story, an invention, a, as an artistic work or a symbol. And um, types of IP rights include trademarks, which is a type of intellectual property uh, consisting of a recognizable sign, design or expression, which identifies products or services of a particular source from those of others. Patents is an other type of IP right, it is an exclusive right granted for an invention. And um, third type of IP right is registered design. A registered design protects only the shape or appearance of a product, and it gives its owners the exclusive right to the design of that product. And the final type is copyright, which is the protection offered for creative works, such as books, music, literary works, and so on. Um, you you get some type of protection automatically, others you have to apply for. And um, as you're aware, we will be focusing on copyright today. So let's begin with what is secondary data. Most, I, I'm sure uh, many of you are aware uh, what secondary data is, but just to uh, provide an information for those who are not uh, aware. Um, unlike primary data, which is collected by a researcher directly from the original source, secondary data is an existing data gathered from studies, surveys, experiments uh, that, that have been run by other people or for other research. For example, existing data available at uh, archives like us or from government organizations essays, reviews, or information from social media. Um, just a quick question. Have you used secondary data or plan to use it? You can just answer in a chat box if you like to answer. I cannot see any response. I'm not sure. Or yeah, just started. I can see. Yeah, so someone has experience. Someone mentioned that they, they don't have. So that's nice. If you if you have uh, used or plan to use secondary data. Yeah, so yeah, that's fine. Thank you very much. So two most relevant types of rights applicable to the secondary data sources are copyrights and database rights, but I will be focusing on copyright in today's session. But I have given a link at the bottom for database rights um, from our website. The, uh, the information is available there and you can have a look on it later on. So. 
Uh, in the following section, I'll go through the copyright and research data. Copyright is an intellectual property right. As I said earlier, it is assigned automatically to the works creator and uh, it prevents unauthorized copying and publishing of uh, an original work. The creator is automatically the first copyright owner unless there is a contract that assigns copyright differently or there is um, a written transfer of copyright signed by the copyright owner that anyone can own it. It um, can vary nationally, but under the copyright UK Copyright Designs and Patents Act 1988, copyright applies to um, originally literary, dramatic, musical, or artistic works, sounds, recordings, films, broadcasts, cable programs, and the typographical arrangement of publication and databases as well. So in the UK, copyright arises automatically once a work is created, uh, but to enjoy copyright protection, the work must be original. That is to say, it must be your own work, not copied from someone else. And there is no copyright in ideas or facts, only in the way those ideas are expressed, such as diagrams and tables. So as researchers, when you need to obtain copyright clearance, for this, you need to bear in mind that you do not need copyright clearance if you incorporate the factual data in your own words um, in a structure owned by yourself. And you may not need to obtain permission if you are making a copy and utilizing that copy for your own research, as long as it is not made available to others or citing from the research data. However, you do you do need copyright clearance if you are going to include the secondary data in a publication or plan to share that data with other people. It also applies to incorporating secondary data in your own database that you intend to share with others. There may be other arising legal issues, for example, where personal data is concerned, not only the permission from the person who has created the work is required, um, who is considered the copyright holder, but permission from all the other people whose personal data is in the work is re required. For example, diary data or audio recordings of the interview, you do need permission, uh, copyright permission before you share that with others. So copyright and research data is a complicated topic. However, I have tried to highlight some important issues when it comes to data sharing. Researchers need to keep in mind certain issues such as licensing frameworks, rights ownerships, challenges when using social media data, and the national variation if your work spans um, outside the UK. So intellectual property rights affect the way both you and others can use your and others' research data, and these is issues. Issues should be considered at the outset of any research project. So you need to consider copyright when the data is created, shared, and reused. For example, when you create a data and plan to make it available for future use, then no doubt you are the copyright owner of the data. But there is another issue you need to consider, which is how you want your data to be made available. And here the role of uh, licensing comes in you are sharing your primary data, then you need to consider about which license to choose. Um, on the other hand, if you are using secondary data, you need to pay attention to the licenses under which that data is available. Uh, data collections can be available broadly under two types of licenses, open licenses and bespoke licenses. Um, as the name implies, open license is the standardized way to grant permission to use the data openly. Uh, for example, the most widely used open license framework is the Creative Common License Framework. Um, Creative Common License Framework offers different options. Three of these options are, have been listed here. The first one, which is um, CC BY, is the most widely used license. As you can see that you are allowed to use and share the data, you can create some derivation with it, adapt it as you require, publish your derived data as long as you acknowledge the original data source. It also allows a commercial use, uh, for example, for non-academic purposes. The only condition is that the credit must be given to the creator. For example, you have downloaded 
downloaded a data set um, from UK data service, which is available under CC BY. You are allowed to use it for your own analysis. You can create your own data uh, using few variables from the original data, and you are allowed to share your data for future use by giving proper attribution to the original source. And um, you can make your data available under any other license that seems appropriate. Um, the second one is CC BY share alike. It is exactly similar to CC BY apart from one condition that any adaptation must be shared under the same license. Your data should be made available as CC BY share alike if, if you use such um, Creative Commons license data. Um, the final CC BY non-commercial has again the similar conditions except that it cannot be used commercially. So. Uh, most of the data made available through responsible repositories such as uh, ours is uh, made available under bespoke licenses, as there may be a residual risk of disclosure in data. For example, data owner might have removed any identifiable information, but there might be any information left in the data, which if combined with other information may disclose, some, disclose someone's identity. So the conditions associated to these bespoke licenses ensures that researchers act responsibly and ethically with the data. Um, UK data service uh, end user license agreement is one of the example of the bespoke licenses we have. So if you plan to use secondary data, always make sure that you are familiar with the terms and conditions under which the data is made available. Um, just to give you the information, here at uh, UKDS, we facilitate three levels of access for data. Open access, safeguarded, and controlled access. Open access for data that contain, uh, is for the data that contains no personal information. Safeguarded access is uh, for the data that contain no personal information, but the data owner considers the risk of disclosures. Uh, resulting from linkage to other data, and it is available under end user license. And users need to register to access data, and users also need to agree to certain conditions, such as not to disclose any identifying information. And um, the controlled access is for the data that may be disclosive. Controlled data are only available to users who have been trained and accredited, and they're usage has been approved by the relevant data access committee and access is through a virtual or physical secure environment. So the next section is about the right to ownership. So um, please bear in mind that rules on IP ownership will depend on national law and individual institution policies and may vary from country to country. However, as a general rule, the copyright in a work is initially owned by the work's creators, but this isn't always the case. So let's see what is the common perception in um, your view uh, regarding ownership. So I would like to ask you to um, join the Mentimeter by using this code to answer a couple of questions in terms of right ownership, please. Yeah, you can join the Mentimeter on your mobile phone using this code. Let's see which option you would pick. Who, who owns the right? Is it the university employee or it depends? Yeah. So most of you have answered that it depends, which I would say, yes, that's that's right. And one of you have said that it's university, so that is always right. 
So if a work is created by an employee in the course of his or her employment, the employer owns the copyright unless otherwise agreed upon differently. So the ones who have said that it's university, that is right. But it depends is also right because it may have been agreed upon differently. Many universities or research centers claim ownership of any IP that is generated by academic staff in the course of their employment and also when IP is created using substantial institutional resources. And um, I would say that it depends uh, is also right, as I said, that it, it may be agreed upon differently and uh, it may vary country to country as well. So what do you think, who owns the right? Is it the, in terms of the students, is it university or a student? Or again, it depends. Yeah, that's right. And that's great. Yeah, in terms of students, I think most universities recognize as a general principle that students who are not employees of the university should own the copyrights uh, in the works they produce purely based on knowledge received from lectures and teacher, uh, teaching. However, there may be some circumstances where ownership has to be shared or assigned to the university or a third party. Typically, these include sponsored students, so students working on research, thesis, or publications in collaboration with the academic staff. So I would say um, those who have um, selected students are right as well. And again, it depends. Um, students own the rights, but there is a possibility that it may have been agreed upon differently. So it may vary institution to institution. And again, the um, country to country variation is always there. So in terms of the research funding, if you receive any research funding, who owns the right? Is it a funder or a researcher? Or again, it depends. I think it's, it's clear by now. Yeah, research funder may also, also wish to exert some claim over rights, although in most cases, IP rights are attributed to the researcher unless an out becomes commonly viable. And um, yeah, it's, I think, again, it depends how it has been agreed upon research organizational organizations, policy, country to country variation and all sorts of things. So yeah. It could be the research funder, it could be the researcher, but better to say it depends. So any responses, who owns the right in a collaborative project? Any idea? Yes, needs to be agreed between parties. Exactly, that's right. It depends. So it depends is the answer for all the questions I have asked. All collaborators, depending on the portion of contribution, that's right. It depends on the funding, the nature of the data being used, whether the data is copyright. Yeah, what the collaboration agreement is exactly. It needs to be discussed and decreed upon before starting. That's right. If a university research project has commercial collaborators, there may be joint IP rights in the research outputs, which are best handled via legal contracts or agreements. And researchers should clearly um, clarify ownership and rights relating to research data sources um, for both primary and secondary data being used. And uh, it should be done before starting your research as uh, some of you have mentioned. And um, this in turn will help determine how those data can be published and accessed in the future. So yeah, that's um, so best 
to find the ownership as soon as possible. So thank you very much for your responses. Um, it is not that hard to find out who owns the right if you are affiliated to any university or research center. There should be a staff in there who deals with ethical and legal compliance in research um, such as RUs, or you can find it looking at the applicable national laws of your country, um, national IP laws, um, IP policies of the university and the individual contractual agreements among the university creators and um, sponsors, um, or as a last resort, you can seek um, legal advice to be compliant because failure to do so can cause serious issues for the future uses of your research, such as um, its dim dissemination, any future related research projects or um, profit associated with it. So next issue to consider is the copyright consideration when using social media data. I'm sure you all are very well aware what social media is. It is an umbrella term used for um, internet-based or mobile applications that allow users to form online social networks. And some of the very popular social media platforms include Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Snapchat, LinkedIn. However, the most widely used among these um, in the context of research is found to be Twitter. The data is usually obtained through the application programming interface uh, known as APIs of the social media platforms. APIs are provided by social media platforms to enable controlled access to their um, underlying functions in data. And uh, API acts as an interface between the social media platform and a consumer of social media data. Um, the Twitter streaming API allows researchers and collecting institutions to obtain tweets generated by users in re real time. I'm giving the example of Twitter because uh, this is the most, most widely used uh, in the context of it. Uh, so uh, accessing data through API provides the most authentic record of social media. Um, and social media data available on the platforms includes individual posts or tweets, what people share on a day-to-day -day basis and how people comment or tweets show their opinion, um, their behavior, their likes, dislikes, visual content such as photos, videos, interests, social interactions, networks, current trends. Um, so these different platforms poses a wide variety of functions and appeal to different audiences. Um, they all create a byproduct of valuable data about the users who interact with them. So, yeah, it's again a couple of questions on Mentimeter, if, if you would like to go to Mentimeter. Or you can write in a chat if you find it difficult to switch. So you can use the same code. Have you ever been involved in a research that involves social media data? So some of you have been, that's great, and majority have not. That's all right. Yeah, but some of you have experienced that that is great. And what do you think would be the copyright issues using social media data? Any thoughts on that? The poster owns copyright of their posts can be ethical issues too. Yeah, exactly. There, there are ethical issues as well, in uh, especially in terms of informed consent. And repost hard to find original creator. That's right. Making available on a repository. 
Yeah, that, that is the biggest challenge. Licensing information, attribution, copyright may belong to the user on the social media company, depending on the terms of service. Exactly, that that, that is another challenge. Yeah, social media companies own the rights. Third party ownership, who owns the data? What are the usage terms? Ownership, yeah, exactly. I must say that very um, knowledgeable audience in terms of um, copyright issues. That's right. Thank you very much for your responses. So going back to the presentation, yeah, you, you are right. The terms of use for the most commonly used social media platforms are similar in terms of how they deal with uh, IP rights. Content is protected by copyright in the same way as books and journals. Whatever you post on these platforms is considered your creation, your content. So these platforms clearly states that the users have copyright for their content. Um, you are the copyright holder of your tweets or Facebook page, though you are the copyright holder, but when you agree to the terms and conditions to create your account on these platforms, you sign an agreement that gives the site a license to freely use the work for a variety of purposes, including an opportunity for researcher to access the data for academic research. So researchers using social media data need to abide by these terms and conditions of the platforms or API developers. So all the responses that, uh, you just add in were right. <clears throat> so terms and conditions of these social media platforms or API developers play an important role in terms of the future uses of data such as publishing or archiving. Um, I will again using uh, use Twitter as an example that it is the most widely used social media platform across the world and it is relatively easy for researchers to collect data from it. Um, as an open platform, the majority of uh, tweets are available to public view and researchers can collect large number of tweets in a very short period of time via the platform's API. However, um, it is a valuable source, there's no doubt. Uh, about it, but researchers face challenges when it comes to publishing social media data um, or archiving it for future use. After a researcher or research team has created a data set, it is not usually possible for them to deposit that data with an archive. For example, uh, Twitter policy restricts from sharing any data they obtain from the API and also from storing data in a cloud. The policy does however allow the archiving of tweet IDs, the unique number given to an individual tweet or user IDs, the number assigned to Twitter account holders. Uh, other researchers could use the tweet ID to receive uh, that data or they can recreate a data used in a previous study using those tweet IDs, but only if Twitter continues to provide access to historical data. It is not ideal, but at least it provides a better solution than sharing to in, uh, sharing no information at all about data sources for published studies. Besides this, there may be another challenge. Researchers use different methods to access social media data from APIs, different tools, different platforms, different types of APIs, different resellers with different uh, services which create very diverse types of data set. Um, furthermore, individual researchers use different methods to clean or organize their data as well as different tools and methods for analyzing their data. So in addition to the ideas associated with the data set, information about how the raw data was collected and how it was cleaned is also important and will be required for recreating a data set or understanding how and why it has been altered. So therefore, the archiving of data set identified is more effective if the processes, uh, processes used to create them are also documented. So Twitter places particular restrictions on the form in which tweets may be published requiring certain terms of data to be retained in the published form. And um, the forced retention of this material may pose a challenge to privacy as well. For example, if you need to code some tweets while publishing, you cannot anonymize the tweets 
as Twitter does not allow modification in the content. You need to use the full tweet as it is. So yeah, these, these are some of the challenges. Here I have added a very useful checklist by UCL, though it is for the reviewers, but can be useful for the researchers who wish to use social media data. So yeah, you can have a look uh, at this checklist checklist if you like to, I have added a hyperlink on the slide. Um, now, another important point to keep in mind is the copyright in the international context. So in which country you are carrying out your research, you, you could write um, in a chat box if you like, or you can just go to the Mentimeter, whatever suits you using the same code and QR code. So UK, everyone is from the UK in today's session. So someone, that's great, Spain and Korea. So any more responses? Okay, thank you very much. <clears throat> yeah, so every country has its own copyright laws, uh, but over the years there has been extensive global harmonization of copyright laws through treaties and trade agreements. And um, these treaties and agreements establish minimum standards for all participating countries. Um, the system leaves room for local variation. Um, one of the most significant international agreement is the Bern Convention, though it was signed originally in 1886, but it has since been revised and amended on several occasions. And this treaty lays out several fundamental principles upon which all participating countries have agreed. And one of those principles is national treatment, which means that all countries must give foreign works the same protection they give to the works created within their borders, assuming the other country is a signatory. Um, besides this, the minimum standards also include the type of work protected, duration, limitation, exceptions, and so on. And almost uh, all the countries, I think, think apart from five or six countries, all the countries are members of this convention. So the national laws, laws are built on the similar basic standards, but there may be variation on a country level in terms of type of work, duration, and exceptions. So this is an interesting map, which gives you an idea of differences in copyright duration around the world. So we can have a look at the map from a continental perspective and we can clearly see patterns of same duration with small exemptions. Um, for example, in Europe, almost all the countries with the exception of one adhere to life plus 70 years. Copyright duration. Um, and in comparison in Africa, we can observe more variability with Angolia and Libya. Uh, where it's just life plus 25 years. And Mexico stands out and is actually the only country to adopt life plus 100 years. So then I found this an interesting map. So if you plan to use secondary data, always ensure that you consider these questions who the copyright holder of the data set is, can you use these data sets and in what ways are you allowed to archive and publish them in a data repository? If not, you may need 
to seek uh, further permission to distribute material you do not own because if permission is not granted, you may need to remove copyright, uh, copyrighted variables or material before publishing or sharing. And um, copyright law does uh, allow certain exceptions. For example, you are allowed to copy limited extract of works when the use is non-commercial research or private study. However, in the context of data sharing, researchers are not allowed to share the secondary data unless they are allowed to do so. The majority of uses of copyright materials continue to require permission from copyright owners. So you should be very careful when considering whether you can rely on an exception and if in doubt, you should seek advice. And finally, do remember that the details of the provisions will be subject to the national law. And while most will be similar, details will vary from country to country. For example, users of copyright works based in the UK are subject to the specific exceptions to copyright outlined in the UK copyright laws. Uh, since each country will have its own exceptions to copyright, which are likely to vary, uh, Users in one country will be able to reproduce copyright work under the copyright ex exception um, in ways that users in other countries will not. So always check your national law. Just to give you an example of a secondary data, imagine a researcher has used secondary data source for a research project and uh, intend to share this data for future reuse. Um, he has used World Bank and Microsoft Academics, um, the sources of data. And he has used um, secondary sources. So due to the time constraint, I have uh, added a screenshot from the terms and conditions from these sources. So the first thing he, you know, he needs to check is the terms and uh, conditions associated with these secondary sources whether he is allowed to share their data uh, or not. So the, these, um, this information is usually at the bottom of the web page, but sometimes hidden and need effort to find out. I have put the terms here. From This is the screenshot from the World Bank here. You can see that it is mentioned that there is no restriction on sharing the data with the third parties. So that should be fine. However, this is a screenshot from the Microsoft Academics uh, where it says that you cannot modify, distribute, pu publish um, the, uh, the information you have taken from Microsoft Academics. So you need to obtain permission. So always check that the terms and condition if you plan to deposit your data for future reuse. Here on this slide, I have added links to our web pages on copyright and access levels. I have also added a useful template, uh, variable information log, a link to this template for data sets being deposited that include secondary data sources. Researchers are advised to prepare this log describing the resources and uh, it allows others to understand and use data correctly, but it also ensures that uh, Repositories can check the appropriate terms and conditions applicable to onward sharing. And this um, should include the variable name, source, how it was collected, brief description, and any restrictions on its future use. So that that, that is a useful source. Um, here are some links to the useful resources that you can have a look in your own time. Again, some more useful resources. And before I finish, I would like you to go to the Padlet I have created uh, using the link or QR code to discuss some case studies. I hope that these case studies are useful for you. So you, you, uh, we will start with the case study one, copyright in a project based on diary data. So you can post comments and we, we can start from one and go um, towards the end.
people have started writing so that that's great so the first uh, scenario or case study is about a copyright project based on diary data so how would you ensure copyright issues in that context so someone has written that rights would need to be established yeah that's right in a information sheet in consent form negotiate with diary writer they may consider licensing and discussions and agreements before starting that's that's right yeah so you can use the information obtained in the discussions for your own research however when it comes to data sharing or publishing you uh, need to obtain consent to share the information and permission to use the data for future research and this is the same with the audio recordings as well so that's right thank you for your responses um, the case study number two is around copyright of the information available online So a researcher studies how health issues around obesity have been reported in the media in the last 10 years. Freely available newspaper websites were used to obtain articles. And these uh, articles are copied into a database and coded according to various criteria for content analysis. And the question is, can the researcher use such public data without breaching copyright? Can the database be archived and shared with other researchers? Yeah, exactly. Everyone so far has said that it dep depends. So even though the articles obtained are freely available online, they might still be subject to copyright, as you said. While such information can be used for personal research purposes, but the articles cannot be archived if they are under, if, if they are not allowed, people are not allowed to use this. So unless permission is obtained, from the newspapers, um, they, they are not allowed to archive it. This will breach copyright. Terms and conditions of all the data used should be checked before the archiving process begins. Yeah, uh, someone said that it is not necessary if the articles, uh, just the articles would have to be correctly referenced and copyright might not allow for resharing. Yeah, you, you can use it for your personal use, but when it comes to data sharing, then you do need to check the terms and conditions. And if it is allowed, then that's fine. You can just properly attribute or cite the source and um, that, that should be fine. But if it is not allowed, then you need to obtain permission. So the third um, scenario is copyright of archived data. So although this um, ISSB data is available for free to all registered researchers, this does not mean that the data can be published on a website and made available to others. The data can be incorporated into a database and used for personal analysis. Before, before this is placed on a website, permission must be sought from the data owner if it is required. Yeah, so yeah, your responses are right. So the third scenario is transcription from a printed work into a spreadsheet. Mm 
when a researcher has copied a series of statistical information from a printed work into a spreadsheet, the transcription is a direct copy with minimal alteration. The book is in copyright. So what could be the issue here? No permission would be required unless this was an open access. Exactly, that's right. That's true. The researchers should uh, the, um, technically have cleared copyright before transcription. Um, if the work is for personal use only, this can probably be disregarded. But if the um, newly constructed data set is to be archived and disseminated, copyright clearance will need to be gained from the copyright holder. Yeah, so it is it is more related to the copyright ownership of the book. This is exactly the same with if someone has used uh, standardized tests or measures and they are uploading it to an archive as a relevant documentation, then they, they also need to ask for permission if it is under copyright. So the last scenario is uh, around copyright of open data obtained from the UK data service. So what do you think the issue here? As it is a copyright data. Not the issue, what needs to be considered, I would say. So in this case, the, the full attribution, yes, that's right. There, there is a joint copyright over the process data uh, shared between the researcher and the crown, which is the holding copyright uh, um, over the original participation survey data. The researcher must declare this jo joint copyright. On the other hand, data collection is published under the open government license, so no further permission from the data creator is required to archive the derived data as long as acknowledgement is provided as described in the OGL. However, it all depends on the licenses attached to the data, so always check the terms and conditions of the source uh, you are going to include. Yeah, so in this case, it's just the full uh, attribution and the joint copyright ownership. Yeah, it, it is under open government license, this particular data set. So open government license requires no per further permission to archive the data set. It is just the attribution, full attribution, which is required. Yeah, thank you very much for your responses. And um, here you can see that you can register for the UK data service using this QR code. You can also sign up for our upcoming train, training and events, and you can also uh, check um, our past training events. Um, the slides are on the website and uh, recordings are on the YouTube channel. So thank you very much. This is a lot of content to take in. Here's my email address. If you have any particular project related questions, you can always email me and I would be happy to discuss it with you.